What's up guys, my name is Lex Veltuis and welcome back to another episode of Lex Reflects. Today we're going to look at another hand in the big game. It's a $100,000 buy-in and it had a loose cannon. Now, PokerStars would supply the loose cannon with $100,000, but with the stipulation they could only bring the profit home. Obviously this is going to drive a lot of action because when the loose cannon is down near the end, they are very much incentivized to drive the action to try and generate a profit. This really creates an interesting table dynamic and you'll see that in both hands. Also, you'll see one of the best calls I've ever made in my entire life. Lex calls, uh-oh. The loose cannon raises, I call from the small blind. The flop, deuce five queen. I decide to lead out 4,500. Lex fires 4,500. Lex just let out out of position. Now, obviously, now it's very easy to look back and think about a lot of the mistakes that we're making back then. But I think it's it's still important to mention what good strategy will be now. I know a lot of you guys are watching these videos now and oftentimes refer to the strategy in the videos and kind of take it as your own. So I think it's important to point out that I don't like this bet. It's also way too big. Um, one of the main things I don't like about this bet is that the big blind is in the pot as well. I'm in a small blind out of position versus two people. The big blind is going to have every single heart combination that's out there. They're going to have jack four of hearts, nine four hearts, you name it. Any heart combination they're going to have. So I don't really want to start firing on this board because I'll never really know where I am against the big blind. Plus they have too many strong hands to continue. They have the most two pairs out of anybody. So generally it's a board you want to take it a little bit easy on. I decide to fire pot. So I bet pot and uh, we see here Bonomo calls. Justin Bonomo is going to come along. Now... We're playing this from the loose cannons perspective. At this point, uh, it's very hard for both of us to have a very ambiguous hand. So with the jack of hearts, I think I would just get out here. It's not that great of a bluff catcher. It's really hard to see if you're good now, if your draw is good. One of us might have the ace of hearts. One of us might have already have a flush. One of us might have a queen. At this point, I would just get out. That away, Russ, we called. We're still in. <laughs> I can't blame him because obviously I'm really aggressive and they hadn't played a hand for a while. But I also think it's a little bit of a trap, like in situations where you play a little bit tight to hang on to the wrong hands. Harlow was playing a little bit tight. He was one of the tighter loose cannons. And uh, he would also, even near the end when he was already down a bunch and he needed to start making some action, he was still folding on all kinds of hands, waiting for good hands. Oftentimes you see when people are playing a little bit tight passive that they sometimes do get out there and play big pots, but it's with good hands in a bad situation. And I really think that this is one of those uh, situations that qualifies as such. Don't really want, there's just no way that's good for this board to develop in a big pot for him. So would have gotten out. Uh, now with Justin there, I really need to take it easy. Um, especially after you call the pot bet, there's somebody 17. calling up behind me. He bet 17,000. I do the opposite, I bet pot. That got Bonomo to fold, so now we're down to heads up. Might as well call us Bessie because I think we're getting milk, Chris. I think what my thinking was back then is that I just wanted to build a big pot against the loose cannon. Um, I know that uh, my image obviously spoke for itself. He made a lot of comments to me about how aggressive I was playing, etc. So I really just wanted to build a big pot um, or put a lot of pressure, right? Because there's always an either or. I can have a really strong hand or I can have a really weak hand. In both scenarios, it's probably good against the loose cannon to blow up the pot. You don't want to play a whole lot of middling pots. Put maximum pressure on Justin Bonomo, who obviously has a lot of flushes, but he also has a lot of dog shit hands uh, because he's in the big blind. It's going to be very hard for Justin to call uh, with a uh, single heart here because of the pot bet. So that's at least an advantage um, that I have going for me here. So now Harlow has to decide again, what is he going to do? And it's a really tough spot again. One thing that's important and a vital piece of information here, I think, that I bet in against two people. Now, the more people somebody bets in against, the stronger they are. I do it on two streets. There's definitely a lot of hands you would want to call because I was playing like a maniac at the highest VPIP of the whole uh, series pretty much. So um, obviously you have jacks, you have a, you have an emergency heart. You're going to be good quite often as well. But, you know, there's still important pieces of the puzzle to kind of decide what you want to do. Might as well call us Bessie because I think we're getting milk, Chris. No, no, no. I feel good. That's right. That's right, Russ. Put us in. We're still playing. There you go. Nice, Russ. He, he calls. So, pot is now 52,000. All right, it's a 10 of spades. River's a complete brick. Gonna help neither of us, generally. We'll have to see what Lex does, but I want to see a showdown for free here. I don't think we're gonna get so lucky. Uh-oh, he's smiling. What does that mean? It means I think we're about to not like what Lex is gonna do. 
I remember when I when that happened, I remember playing the pause and I remember that I just couldn't hold my I was thinking about something I couldn't hold my laugh in. And I was like, wow, this looks really weird. But at the same time, it kind of works for my image back then because I was playing like a lunatic. So there was a lot going on in my head. But I remember that so well. I was like, you know, it's like when everyone is silent in a room because something bad happened when you're a kid and you can't hold your laugh. And that's kind of like one of those moments. I fired 28 grand. All right, so we bet 28,000. And what I want from you guys is now in the comments, without looking further in the comments, to type what you would do and why. Why do you think, what does my bet represent? Why would you do what you do? And what would your decision be? I wanted to fold this hand on the flop just so we wouldn't be in this position, Chris. Hey, listen, don't yell at me. Obviously, pretty tough spot for us. Look, look where we are now. Well, so what do we do? I mean, it's Lex. 28,000 is a pretty good price. We could call, and he could say bored. I really don't think that's very likely at this point, but it is Lex, and he is a maniac. I want to call you so bad. Me too, Ross, me too. I do, I do. Obviously the thing that people will always think about, and that's why he's considering this. Don't do it. Do it. What do you have? Queen nine? Oh, I need a queen to win? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure what that means, but other than the fact that I don't love this board, Lex has taken a very strong line, and we also have to note that our image, which is Russ's image, is that we've been making a lot of tough, good calls. We've picked off a bunch of Daniel's bluffs. Maybe Lex has been paying attention to that. I really think that I got him close to calling with a comment, so there's not a there's not everything that I liked that you saw in a previous video as well that I, when I was talking uh, at the table. You should just fold, you have your profits. Probably not a good idea to remind him the fact that he has profit. Not even thinking about that. The fact that Lex is trying to get us to fold makes me think that we actually should fold. Your reputation precedes you. What? His reputation His reputation, then you should just insta-call based know. on his reputation. We folded. Let's take a look. I think we had him beat. What we have. I think we had him. Not a chance. That's a set of fives, my friend. No good. Ooh, set of fives. Oops. <laughs> I actually do think that my play makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think that the bets with Justin in the pot, like I said, is very dangerous. Um, but I was trying to milk the loose cannon. Now, what's really important to remember is when you play against somebody that's type passive, you're going to have to do a whole lot of the action making yourselves. This also is very nice because you can start making bluffs and you can start leading out with bluffs as well. I do think that the danger of Justin behind us really makes it a difficult strategy to execute with bluffs, um, but I'm not really playing against uh, Justin Bonomo on that hand. I'm playing against uh, Russ Harlow, and I want to get him for the max. Definitely made some sort of like value betty size on the river, but again, that's fine. You're not playing against a super pro. You're, get, you're playing against somebody that uh, you're trying to get paid off by. Uh, obviously, Russ was up. He sniffed this one out correctly. Um, I do think that against a loose cannon, I kind of like my line. It's like big, big, and then sort of like, you know, half pot. Um, you know, I'm not trying to shove on the river because then at that point, I think that I'm only going to get called by flushes. I think one of the interesting things about this hand is the loose cannon dynamic. And that really, really, really comes into play into the next hand that we're going to see. All right, so onto the second hand. I think that it's a very interesting hand because uh, of the loose cannon dynamics. We raise the king eight suited, which is uh, very much above the rim of what I would normally raise. Normally I'd, hands, I'd have hands like this. And what's very, very important to mention here is that Russ Harlow was down quite a bit of money. I, I believe he was stuck like 50,000 and he really needed to get above $100,000. This was late in the session, so he didn't have a whole lot of options anymore. Harlow checks. Russ has given Lex a chance to fire at this. He does, betting 2,700. I bet 2700, which is about half pot. I really thought at this point that Daniel would play a very wide range trying to play pot with Russ. Daniel was extremely good at sniping out uh, loose cannons over this series, and he had a really good strategy to play against them. Obviously, you want to play a lot of pots when somebody's going to blow up the pots. So he calls from a small blind at this point. I would literally give him hands like four deuce suited as well, um, but also some stronger hands, of course, because he really wants to keep Russ in. His target is not to play against me, but to play against a loose cannon. I really thought that Russ Harlow would um, blow up the pot uh, on the flop if he had a big hand, but also pre-flop, right? So if he has a hand like ace-jack or ace-10, he's just going to try and get money in, especially against two of the loosest players at the table. So once the board comes ace-high, I'm pretty much discounting his range because I just don't think 
uh, there's going to be a whole lot of strength in it. Lex's bet could easily just be a C bet, which it is, and Russ checks, so he looks pretty weak. Four deuce should be an insta fold, so it looks like Daniel's cooking something up here. Okay, so this is where the hand gets interesting. And he cooks up a raise to 7,200. Daniel is cooking something up. Good spot. Daniel's juiced the pot for the guy with the best hand. But he folds. That's a ridiculous fold. Russ just doesn't have enough time or chips to fold there. Pretty crazy folds. At that point, you really have to go for some hands, but I think this was a recurring problem for him. <laughs> nice. Confusing? Yeah, it's confusing to me. Action back on Lex, who has just king high. And I was actually speaking the truth there. I, this was confusing to me. I really thought that Negranu would trap all of his big hands that he would hit on this board. So if he does have a hand like sixes, and you have a, a, a guy behind you that needs to make a profit so that he can bring money home, why on earth would you push somebody off their hand? And this hand literally shows um, the problem with that because Russ folded an ace. So you, f you, you have somebody behind you that folds a relatively strong hand that needs to play big pots. And this just shows that uh, that strategy wouldn't have worked. So that's what I noted that it was just weird for me to get the loose cannon out of the pot and play a pot against me. Lex calls. A stone float. This made me... Would have given Russ trips. This would made me feel that uh, Daniel actually was just attacking my loose range because I played so, so many hands. So Daniel was trying to take the pot away from me, and I thought through the loose cannon dynamics that that's what his plan was. This is obviously a great card for me. Less chance that he has an ace. It's very unlikely he check raises a jack. Of course, hearts are going to be in his check raising range, so the river is not a great card at all. But both these guys were up to the same thing, checking the turn so they can fire a bet on the river without it having to be too big. There's that Veldhausian stare. Daniel's going to have first crack at it. He bets 9,000. All right, so Daniel goes for a half-size pot bet. At this point, you have to really consider that Daniel's pretty much saying that he has a flush or nothing. I really think that with all of his strong hands, he's going to continue on the turn. He really wants to tax me. He also wants protection from uh, both flush draws. Of course, he could have some sort of like check race plan, but I don't think that this is really the situation that calls for it, especially with the ace pairing. Daniel isn't going to have that many boats because ace jack and jack still probably re-raise before the flop. Obviously, he can call some ace-jack. Pocket sixes is an excellent uh, hand to just get a lot of value from because I'm going to call with a lot of my combo draws, like queen-10 suited, um, and also call with all of my aces. Sixes literally unblocks every single strong thing that I can have, and it's also uh, one of the most likely strong hands that he has from a small blind calling there. He checks a turn, so I pretty much at this point think that my king high is going to be good a lot. The river's a heart, which of course is pretty nasty. Um, I do think that Daniel would have bet bigger uh, had he made a flush on the river. Um, also, there's a lot of advantages for hearts to continue betting the turn. All of my floats, uh, hands like king, queen, queen, 10, king, 10, all the missed trade draws uh, uh, are going to give up on the turn. So I do think that um, if he has a hand like eight, seven of hearts or king, king, eight of hearts or whatever, uh, that he had a really good spot to get me off the hand on the turn. So if you match all those things together, I just don't think this really, um, this really tells a very uh, good story about the hand. Um, also, I'm getting a pretty good price. 9,000 makes it seem like he wants to get called. Only have to be right like one out of four times. Looks like Lex might have to reconsider his float plans. I don't block spades. I don't block single heart hands. I could check raise. The ground who could have a hand like king queen with a heart, which is actually a very, very reasonable hand. He does call. I will play the board. <laughs> king Haya. That's good. Nice call. Jeez. What the hell was that? That was sick. I had four high. You missed his draw. That is just a sick, <laughs> sick call. Thank you. What did you put me on exactly? Four high? <laughs> four high. <laughs> that was sick. I didn't think you had anything on the flop. He's right. He put you on a busted flush draw till the flush hit. Till the flush hit. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really sick call. Did you see that? That comment from Barry Greenstein has always annoyed me so much. He put you on a flush draw until the, until the flush hits. It's like, calm down, you old nit, okay? It's, like, it's, it's so weird. Like, somebody makes a hero call, and he has to say something derogatory about it. You know what I mean? That's like typical Greenstein uh, fashion. But, um, yeah, so I'm super proud of this call. I really think that... 
Uh, this call really illustrates what table dynamics at a live poker table can do. This is something that's almost impossible online. Obviously, online is going to be a lot more theory, um, and live poker really gives you the option uh, to go over hands like this. You know the characters, you see the dynamic, you see people that want to play certain pots together, and especially during live cash games, uh, this really comes forward a lot. Uh, this is the period of time where I played a lot of high stakes, um, and I think that experience came through. I do also think that I understood the, the loose cannon concept pretty well, but lots of props to Negrano because he played excellently against the loose cannons. I think he took out a lot of them uh, purely based on dynamics, and noticing that during the season really um, helped me uh, solve this hand. So uh, this is definitely one of the prouder hands that I played on TV because I just think that it's a sick call. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you guys enjoyed the backstory. Uh, obviously, like, subscribe if you want to see more of this content. Um, it's really cool to connect with my past and we're going to do more of it in the future. All right. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, but I think that's what he wanted me to oh, do. Oh, you think he was doing reverse reverse? Like, ooh, I'm bluffing, but I'm not. I don't do that. I just always bluff. <laughs>